Now, who doesn't love a good lamp rendering? I know I do. Lighting fixtures are not that hard to render, but the actual part that emits light, whether it's a light bulb or an LED-based lamp, that can be a challenge to render. So in today's tutorial, I'll walk you through how to create this rendering of an architectural spotlight. We'll be spending most of our time on how to get that lens where the light emits looking really, really good. Now to get the most out of this lesson, I highly recommend you follow along with me. Download the project files for free from the file vault. I've linked it down below in the description and be sure to stick around until the end. I've got a bonus tip that you won't want to miss. Step number one is to import that step file that you downloaded from the file vault. We'll take the default import settings, although I've set the tessellation quality up to 0.3 and we should see that we have a lighting fixture with some pink walls. Let's go to the scene tree, expand the model and we're gonna hide the walls for now. We'll come back to that in a bit. So here's our lighting fixture. Now I think a square aspect ratio is going to suit us a little better than this 16 by nine. So I wanna go to image, resolution presets, landscape, and down to one by one. So this will give us our square aspect ratio. The next thing I wanna do is set up my camera, which uh, we'll go to the camera tab and create a new camera. And for this product, I want a pretty conservative product shot. So I want a longer focal length. So we'll go to 85 millimeters. And for this product, I want to see a little bit of the underside because this would be mounted to a ceiling. And this is like a little modern lighting fixture that you would point at, I don't know, a piece of artwork on the wall or something like that. So I want to see something like this, kind of a good three quarter view. And a big focus of this tutorial is going to be spent on the lens, of course. So we would definitely want to see into the lens or the uh, glass part here. So I'll go ahead and save my camera for now. That's good enough. The next thing we want to do is change our lighting. So if we look at our environment, we have our startup HDRI. Let's find something a little bit more practical. And I'm going to go for an interior. Uh, I'm going to opt for this office space, this office hallway. But there's a couple things I want to change. First off, it's, it's enormous. So let's scale it down. I'll go to about 5,000 millimeters or 5 meters. The other thing is we've got a lot of color blue and green coming in here. So if we have those reflected in here, that could um, contaminate the color of the scene. So let's go ahead and desaturate it a bit. So we'll go to the HDRI editor and then under saturation, I'll bring it down to something like 15%, just very, very low because it's a very colorful HDRI. Now it went all blurry, so we need to refresh that HDRI. And the last thing I wanna do is because this is an object mounted into the ceiling, it would be odd if something on the floor was reflecting into it. So I suggest to go to the settings and go to the height and just move that HDRI down as far as we can. So now if we're looking at our product, there's a good chance that anything reflecting in it is close to the ceiling. And we're not gonna rely on this lighting a ton. We're gonna actually light with some physical lights before we're finished, but this is just a good starting point for now. All right, let's go back to our saved camera. Uh, oh, I also wanna go into product mode under our lighting tab. This will allow for some balanced light. Let's go ahead and at this point, apply some basic materials to most of this. We'll just search for a hard, rough, black plastic, and I'll just drag it onto one of these parts. I'm pretty much gonna make this all the same, so hold shift, left click once to copy that material, shift, right click to paste it linked to all these other parts in the scene. And we can set, put on that set screw for now. And then there's actually another piece inside here. If I were to hide this little panel here, there's another piece. So I'll paste it on there as well. Before I edit this material any further, I'd like to go to the environment tab and make this a little bit brighter, maybe 1.5. And then I also wanna rotate this. So I'm gonna hold control and left click and drag to rotate where the light is reflecting off of my light. I think that looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and hit C on the keyboard just to enter color background mode. I'll darken this so it's not a pure white, just a little bit. So let's go ahead and make some adjustments to this material. And the way I like to do this is in the material graph. So double click on it. And we're just gonna add some quick textures to make this material a little more interesting. So I wanna get two noise textures. You do that by right clicking and go into texture and one will get noise texture and another one will get noise fractal. We're gonna combine these two using a utility node called bump add. So we plug one into bump one, one into bump two, and bump add goes into the bump on the plastic. 
Now our scale is way too large, so we're gonna go into noise texture and set this down to one, and we'll turn off sync, and we'll go into noise fractal, set this also to one, and turn off sync. Now they're a little bit small, so let's go ahead and take the bump height to say 0.3, for both of these. And the reason we combine these two textures is because sometimes when you scale down these procedural textures in Keyshot really small, they can create some unwanted artifacts. Now, it's still a little bit tough to see, but if I zoom in here, you can see the noise fractal is actually showing up more than the noise texture. So let's take that noise texture and let's make that a little bigger. So 0.5 as far as the bump height goes. And I wanna scale it down a little bit too. So instead of one millimeter, I'll do something like 0.8, actually let's keep that one at one, and then noise fractal actually is a little bit bigger overall. So let's bring that one down to 0.8. Uh, the other thing we can do under noise fractal is take the fall off up to something like two, and that's just gonna make it look a little bit chunkier. Now when I zoom out, rather than it looking a little bit smooth, we have this actual defined texture in here. And you can play with how large the scale of these is depending on how far zoomed out you are from the product. And then the last thing I like to do is our roughness on our plastic currently is at 0.15, which is a little high. If I bring it down to 0.1, you'll notice it, it gets a little shinier. I actually like to add some variable roughness for some realism. So we'll right click, go to textures and granite, and we're gonna get a, another node, utility node called color to number. And the way this works, we'll connect the granite to the input of the color to number, and we'll plug the color to number into the plastic node, let go and choose roughness. Now to preview our color to number, click C and double click our granite so we can scale it down to something like 100 millimeters. And we'll take the color and change it to white. From here inside the color no to number, just give it a double click. We're gonna change the values to give us the output we want. So I like to increase this input from just to emphasize some of the contrast in this texture. So if we take that output from, let's bring this up to 0.1 or say 0.08, and then let's take the output two to something like 0.1. So you won't visually be able to see much here, but when we get out of this preview, what we should notice is a subtle variation between some parts that are a little shinier and a little rougher. And if that's too hard to see, I'll, I'll bring this up to say 0.5 so you can see the difference. I'll go to 0.3, 0.2, 0.1, and that's a little tough to see. Let's do, try 0.15 maybe. I think that looks pretty good. And maybe we'll take, yeah, so basically if I let this render, you can see there's some areas almost look like smudges, you know, and that's gonna create that, that variable roughness there. So it's just something I like to do to create a pretty realistic looking plastic or a powder coated painted material. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and go back to our camera. One thing that bothers me a little bit, do you see how this top of the bracket is lining up with this other detail? It just, I don't like that. So I'm gonna change my camera angle down a little bit so we don't have these two details touching. This just looks a little bit better compositionally to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that camera. Before we get this light to shine, we need to understand how metal and glass interact with light. If you shine light at a fully specular material like polished metal in Keyshot, it won't light up like most other materials, which have a diffuse property. When a beam of light hits a polished metal surface, it will be reflected away from the metal at the same angle. So in order to see light on the surface of a polished metal, you need to have something bright that looks like light for the metal to reflect, such as a white plane, for example. This is why you'll never see a spotlight or point light reflected in metal within Keyshot. Now, if you shine a light at a piece of perfectly smooth, flat glass, most of the light will pass right through it. We call this transmission. With smooth glass, we don't illuminate the surface, but objects can be reflected off the surface just like polished metal. When we have curvy glass, we will see something called refraction. These are internal reflections where the light reflects off an internal surface and often gets distorted as it transmits through the glass structure. Most lens or lighting assemblies are all a combination of metal, glass, or optical plastic materials. This is why we're going to need to rely more on reflection to get our lamp to look illuminated. So inside this assembly is where all the magic is going to happen. So we're going to need to take a look at the LED assembly now. I'm gonna start by turning off the front housing and we're gonna turn off the middle housing, control alt and left click to hide a part. That's a, the shortcut if you wanna do that. So I'm actually just gonna turn off a bunch of these parts for now. And we're gonna focus on this 
LED housing. So right here we have a plastic bulb housing. So I'm gonna just take this hard rough plastic that we used in the beginning and just assign it. Uh, no, we do not wanna link it with the material we just made. So we're gonna say no. And this is just basically the overall container for this LED housing. So let's hide it with control alt left click. And then inside here, we have another piece called a metal shield. Let's wait on that. Let me start off with the clear materials first. So this is a, a lens that covers the entire thing. Let's double click on this and change it to dielectric. Dielectric is more or less like a glass material. It just offers you some more advanced options. So we're gonna go ahead and hide this and we're gonna also double click on this part here. This part is called the optical element and we're gonna go ahead and change this to dielectric as well. Now this makes all sorts of interesting stuff happen. If we uh, only show this part, which we can do by holding Alt and left clicking, we will see that this is a pretty fancy shape. The shape of this is designed to move the light in the direction that you want. And this is gonna give a lot of shape to our light inside this lighting fixture. So let's go ahead and turn on some of these other parts here. So we have the plastic PCB. This is where the lights are basically mounted to, these little LED chips. So if we turn off our optical element, you can see we have lights on here. So for this, I'm just gonna do a hard rough plastic white. Just pop that on there. We have these little green parts too. I suppose I didn't, I didn't apply the materials properly to that. So I'm just gonna do shift left click, shift right click. Uh, to, to copy paste onto all those other parts. Now, plastic, white plastic can be quite noisy, so we might want to change this to a diffuse material instead. And then these little yellow squares, these are gonna be our area lights. They represent like a PCB mounted LED. So let's change this to an area light and shift left click to copy, shift right click to paste onto all the others. So now they're all linked up and they have the same material applied to them. Now what we wanna do is turn on some of our other parts. So we have the optical element and then we have this plastic bulb housing. Now you might notice it's really dark inside there. Also ignore the noise, we're gonna work on that in a second. But do you notice how dark it is in there? There's one vital part that we need and I'm gonna turn it on and it's called this metal shield. If I hide the plastic bulb housing, I'm gonna change this to a metal material and as soon as we do that, we should see that the inside of our bulb looks quite a bit nicer. The next thing we need to do in order to get rid of some of these black areas is increase our ray bounces. So inside our lighting tab, we're gonna take our ray bounces from 14 all the way up to 24. There's fewer of these black voids inside here. Eventually, we actually are gonna want this closer to 32 and that should be plenty. The next thing I wanna do is take this metal material that we were working on, and I just think it looks nice if you move into measured mode. By default, it's gonna apply a gold material, and for the design of this specific lighting fixture, I liked having some of this gold accent in there. I think it just looks kind of premium, so that's what we're gonna work with. But if you, in the future, just want a plain old white reflector light, uh, there's nothing wrong with just using the white metal, but we're gonna go with gold today. So there's a lot going on here in this little lighting fixture. Each one of these parts actually plays a pretty instrumental role in getting this to look like a realistic lighting fixture. So what we want to do is turn all these parts back on so we can see what this thing looks like. And uh, you should be able to see if we look right at it, each of those LEDs. And then if we go at an angle, we're gonna notice lots of distortion going on thanks to refraction. Now, before we go and address this ugly noise, there is something else I'd like to do. In the image tab, we need to take advantage of something called tone mapping. And I don't have a dedicated tutorial on tone mapping quite yet, I, I really should. But what we wanna do is go and create a new image style by clicking this button here and go into photographic mode. Watch what happens to these bright white areas when I go into photographic mode. It's subtle, but you might've noticed that the bright white areas became well, not pure white, but a little bit of like a gray. This is important because it's going to allow us to avoid overexposed clipped areas, which are going to help us obtain something that looks more like a photograph and less like a bad rendering. So we can play with our exposure and contrast in a little bit, but for now, let's just, let's just leave these where they're at. Let's address the noise because I know this is something a lot of people run into. And no matter how long I let this render, it's pretty much just gonna keep getting worse. So what can we do to reduce noise in this specific scenario? All right, let's go ahead and start off by going to the scene tab and we're gonna look at the area lights that we have those, those little LEDs, you know, these little squares in here. Let's go ahead and check out those materials. So they're buried in there, 
and the easiest way to edit their materials is just in the scene tree. You see the little light symbol? In fact, we could even say show lights using the filter up top, and now we can just double click to edit one of those. They have a front and a back side. So if we tick off both these boxes, you'll notice they're not showing any light. But if I turn on apply to front of geometry, now they're only facing the front direction. They're not shooting light out back behind it. So just turning off apply to back of geometry should reduce some of the noise quite a bit right from the get-go. The next thing we need to do, and this is very counterintuitive, so please listen closely to this one, we need to make them a lot less bright. Even though in real life you may have a very bright light, when it comes to rendering, bright area lights, especially small ones, make lots of noise. So we need to bring this value down. And here's the funny thing, as I reduce this brightness, you'll notice it doesn't actually change how bright the inside of this looks, at least not very much. So if I cut this in half to go to 500 instead of 1000, mostly the noise goes away, but it still looks pretty much the same. And that's really because no matter how bright they are, as long as these little squares look white, the metal reflector inside here and the glass is going to reflect them, creating the appearance of light. So believe it or not, I bring these all the way down to something like five. And this is what is going to take care of most of the noise reduction. And it's gonna give us some more detail back inside our lighting fixture. You'll notice these areas in the back are not blown out like they once were. So after that, we can actually further reduce the noise by increasing the samples on these lights. So right now they're set to nine. I like to bring these up pretty high. So we'll go to like uh, 24. And when you increase the light samples of a physical light, it's going to reduce the chance of it causing more of these fireflies, which is good. The other thing is we're, we're moving this light through these pieces of glass. So I wanna take these pieces of glass and also increase the samples of them. So I'll double click right here to edit the first lens. And under roughness, I'm gonna bring the samples from 16 up to 24. And we're gonna go into the optical element behind there. Let's go ahead and get rid of our filter up here. Just show all. Our optical element, I'll double click on it. And we want to change this to 24 as well. So now we've increased uh, material samples on the area light as well as the glass that it's uh, transmitting through. The last thing is on the side of this plastic piece, we are getting noise right on the this black plastic housing. Because the noise is gonna show up on this, we want to increase the material samples on this material as well. Now when I double click on it, you'll notice it's just a basic plastic and there's no way to increase the material samples. So there's a weird hack we're gonna do in Keyshot, change this to a transparent plastic. I know it sounds weird, but once we do this, all we need to do is take the specular transmission, which controls how much light passes through it, set it to black and no more light will pass through it. So now we're back to looking like a plain old plastic, but underneath our roughness, we can now increase these samples to say 24 as well. So when I turn on the housing, I see that we're gonna get fireflies on the outside of this piece too. So let's take a little detour, change this to plastic transparent, black out that specular transmission, then under the roughness, let's bump that to 24 too. The reason I wanted to not rely on denoising right away is because if I turn this on, watch what happens to our texture. You'll notice we get this weird grid pattern and in some cases our texture just starts to disappear. It looks overly smooth, so we don't want that. Now let's bring that denoise down to a small value like 0.2. That is enough to add some smoothing but not completely wipe out our texture. Now here's the other thing. We could take denoising away and just rely on the Firefly filter. So if I zoom in here on the lens and I take the Firefly filter and crank it all the way up, watch all these little white pixels go away. I mean, that works really well, which is awesome. The problem with relying on the Firefly filter turned up so high is all of our highlights on the edges of this plastic disappear. So if I turn that off, you see how we have some nice reflections coming on the edges of our form. If we have some highlights, which we will later on the front edges of these plastic parts, the Firefly filter is gonna kill those specular reflections and it's just not gonna look correct. So I tend to try to render without denoising if possible, which is why I went through all those other ways to get rid of fireflies. And then as a last resort, we can use a little bit of denoising. I do about 0.2 to 0.3, and I'll do the same thing for firefly filter. And that's about the most I want to use here, okay? Okay, so if you're really impatient, we could just call this done, but I really want this lens to look super, super nice. And there's a few more things that I'd recommend you consider before we move on. 
I'm gonna go and hide that housing once again, and I wanna talk about this lens fixture. There's a couple things we can do here. First of all, this piece that we've selected, this outer piece, this is fine as is, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and hide it. So on the inside is our optical element, and it's the curvy piece of plastic or glass. If we want to get a little more interesting results with this, we can do a couple things. First of all, we can take the refractive index and increase it. Watch what happens when I go from 1.5 to 1.8. You'll notice it looks very different. So just by adjusting the refractive index, we get more distortion and it's gonna make all the stuff inside here look a little more swirly and it's gonna reflect more light off the surface and it's gonna change the overall color and appearance. So if I go from 1.8 to 1.7, you'll notice it is a little less extreme, 1.6. You could go extreme in the other direction, all the way up to like two, and this looks pretty cool, but 2.4-ish is a diamond, so we're not really likely to have a two for our refractive index here. So I would personally keep it under 1.8, but um, I think that produces a pretty nice look, so that's what I'm gonna use. And then the other thing we could do is you could introduce something called dispersion. And if we bring this up to like 20, you'll see there's a bunch of rainbowy colors in here. This is a really cool effect that happens. We won't get into why. I have another tutorial on it with a little Lego guy. But the point is you can use this to introduce some cool color in here if you'd like as well, which I personally like the look of. Now, if you really wanna go a little further and have more control over this material, I will tell you that instead of dielectric, you can actually use something else called multi-layer optic. So let me just demonstrate that real quick. I could go and go into multi-layer optic and we just need to create a new dielectric as our base layer. And then as I create a new layer on top of it, I can change the refractive index of that layer and the Abbey number. And as I play with that layer thickness, we should start to see some color shifting appearances. So even here for a second, we were getting some cool bluish color and some greens in there. And we can play with that refractive index to adjust the color. Now you can go way over the top with this. I tried to show you a pretty extreme example just to demonstrate how it works, but you can use this really subtly to create some cool coded lens effects as well. They'll be a little more noticeable on this optical element because of its shape and the amount of refraction inside it than if you were to apply it on the flat lens that goes on the very outside. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and just move forward with this dielectric here instead of the multi-layer optics, but just letting you know you have the option with the multi-layer optics as well. And then as far as the actual color of the light coming out of our LEDs, I think it's good to stick to some more realistic values. So I'm gonna use something on the Kelvin scale here for my color for my LEDs. I'm gonna to go to something that's pretty neutral, but a little on the cooler end of the spectrum. Now let's go ahead and try to bring this scene across the finish line. We're gonna turn our housing back on. Let's see, where's our, where's our mount? Let's get that back in here. So we'll go back to our camera. And at this point, I wanna bring in some more area lights to light this better and our walls as well. Now, before I turn on the walls, let's go to that lighting tab. One more thing we wanna turn on here is caustics. Um, maybe should have showed you this a little bit earlier. Sorry about that. But when we turn this on, this is going to also help us calculate more light inside here. That's just gonna help it look a little bit better. Inside our scene tab, I wanna turn on those walls. I'm gonna search for a drywall material, which I like to use on walls. Just drag that on in. So now it's time to add some area lights. Zoom on out and we're going to use this shortcut. So if you go to edit, add light, area light is shift one. So in the future, if you hit shift one, it'll produce a plane with an area light already applied to it. So I'm gonna rotate this out, move it over. And I want this pointing pretty much at the side of my light because well, it's just gonna look, it's gonna look nice. One thing that you might notice is it's hard to see what is going on in your scene if you're moving around lights like this. So I like to use the geometry view, which we'll do in just a second. So I'll go ahead and hit okay to take this light where it's at. Next, what I wanna do is duplicate this light. So I'm just going to select it, right click and duplicate, move it on over. And we're gonna do this one more time, just duplicate the light and move it on over. So we have three different lights. We're going to rely much less on the HDRI, and we're gonna use these three lights to finish off this scene. And uh, before I go into that camera, if I double click on this light, if we show um, visible to camera, it will turn it off. So we can take these and hide them from the camera. And then we can go to our camera, our saved camera, and inside our geometry view, if you don't see it, you should be able to hit this button up here to bring up the geometry view. Move it on over to the right. We're gonna use Control, Shift, Alt, right click 
in the geometry view to center all these parts. So now we can see what our rendering is going to look like, but focus on the left to move our parts around. What I want to do at this point is turn off essentially the HDRI so we're seeing only lights coming from our area lights. And already it looks pretty good, but what we want to do is light intentionally. So let's turn off the two later area lights and just work with the first one. So we're going to right click and move selection. And we're just going to move this around until it reflects on the area light, or I'm sorry, on our spotlight. This is our spotlight, the way we want it to. So in my case, I'm thinking that I want the reflection right along the side here. I think that looks pretty good. Let's maybe stretch it out a little bit and maybe make it a bit smaller, move it down a bit. It's looking pretty good. I'm going to tilt it up and uh, move it down a little further. And I think that's good for now. It's a little dark, so I'll go ahead and double click on it and change its brightness to 3000 lumen. I think that looks pretty nice. And again, I'd like to go for a bit of a neutral light. We could even go for some warm lighting if we wanted, but I think this product is very modern and I think it will benefit from a cooler lighting scheme here. So let's turn this area light off and turn on the next one. This one, we want to actually reflect into the lens a little bit because this lens is still not as bright as we want it to be. So I'm gonna right click and move selection and we want to rotate this. If I hold shift, it will snap, snapping it at 90 degrees moving it a little closer. So now we're starting to reflect it into the light a little bit. There's a cool way we can do this. If we set our target, this little crosshairs, and if you select the part you want it to pivot around, like the front, I'll hit okay. Now our move tool snaps there, and we can move our light in relation to this part. One thing that I wanna do is kind of get this to reflect into the lens a little bit, if possible. So notice down, by having it down here, it's actually pushing light into this as well, which I think is helping to illuminate it quite a bit. We can also play around with how far over it is. And if you want to scale it up, which I do, I'm gonna go ahead and hit this button to reset the pivot so it snaps to the plane. Grab that cube, scale it up, and that makes it a bigger light source. And now it's just kind of all reflecting into that lens quite a bit. So I think that looks pretty good. I think the, the, the last roll uh, our third light needs to play is to highlight some of these edges. This light is still at a thousand. Let's try bringing it up, same thing, to three thousand. You'll notice how much brighter everything gets. And we now have some detail inside the plastic housing as well. So I think that looks pretty good. We may need to drop this down in brightness. Let's actually set the color to not be pure white, and I think that'll help knock it back a little bit. All right, final stretch. So we have one more light. So this light's actually doing pretty well right where it's at. I wanted to highlight the edges of the actual shape of this, this product. So I'm gonna take the brightness up to uh, 3000 again, which is pretty bright. Maybe I'll do the same thing, kind of neutralize the lighting color a little bit. And I'm gonna move it around in the geometry view until it's reflecting off the surface I want. I think I'm going to need to pivot around the front of this light a little bit. So if I do this, I'm not quite getting it where I want it to. Let's go ahead and rotate it this. I think I need to bring it quite a bit a bit closer maybe and higher up. Good enough for now. This may be too bright when we turn all three of these lights on. I suspect it will be too bright. So let's try that. Let's turn all three of our area lights on. Um, we just need to dial some of these back a bit. I'm going to take the side light down to say two. Let's try 1500. And this one down here. Let's bring this down to a thousand. And this one here, let's bring this down to about a thousand. I might make this other light a little bit smaller and something like kind of skinnier and taller. I'm still not happy with these reflections. It's not quite, not quite getting what I want out of it. Let me go brighter. That's looking pretty good. If I go into this black paint material or plastic, whatever we're gonna call it, bring it down a little bit, maybe eight. And then, you know, the index of refraction makes it look a little shinier. I might pop this up to 1.5, just make it a little bit shinier. As far as the walls in the background, I think I might also darken those just a bit more and take them to a little bit more bluish color, maybe something like that. And then the corner of this room is kind of distracting to me. So let's go ahead and move it. So if I just right click move part geometry view, I can move the whole thing back. So I can actually hide the corner of that wall if I want to, which I think it looks better without the corner. And at this point, we have no influence from our HDRI. We could bring this back in if we wanted. Maybe we need to 
make these uh, area lights even less bright. I I'm gonna scale this one down just a little bit, make it a little smaller. And I think even the same thing goes for this one. Scale this down just a bit more. I'm trying to um, avoid over lighting this product essentially. It is a black product on a dark, uh, a whitish background, so it helps to have a lot of light in here. Okay, so before I go and render this, I will say the only reason this lens looks so good is because I've got these nice pieces of geometry here. If you're handed a light by a client or you're given something like this that doesn't have this optical element, this glass optical element inside it, you could just take a cylinder. You could go edit, add geometry, add a cylinder, and just basically scale and rotate that into place. And then like, for example, if I change this from dielectric to say a cloudy plastic, and I make this a little more cloudy, maybe 0.5, maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.8, something like that. Maybe I add a little bit of roughness, 0.1. Then we get this kind of nice satin finish and we still see some of the light inside with the reflector. If you don't have a reflector, then maybe you just put a sphere inside there and you apply your light to that. I think you get the idea there. Um, you will probably, if you don't have all these internal parts, need to get a little bit creative on how to create the um, idea that there's a light inside there. And right before I go and press this render button, I realized I forgot to turn on depth of field. Go figure. I'm gonna go into my camera tab hit that depth of field button, and I wanna click this target to set the depth of field or the focal point and click where I want it to be the sharpest. I want it to be a little bit behind the front of the light. And I'm gonna bring up the f-stop to a number that looks, what I wanna do is soften or blur the background a little bit while keeping the rest of the product pretty well in focus. And in the geometry view, we can actually see these focal planes where it's in focus, pretty good. I might go a little higher, I'm gonna go to 75. I want this to be pretty subtle. And then I'll go ahead and hit save. So if you are curious about how to figure out your render settings, um, our real-time render settings are good. That's all these, we don't wanna change those. But if you wanna figure out how many samples to render to, just use a region render. That's Control Shift R, and that gives you this little box. We can draw this box around the noisiest part of our image. We let this sit and we look at this heads up display, which if you don't have, it's H on your keyboard. You'll watch the samples increase. And when the render rendering looks smooth in here, when you don't see these fireflies anymore, that's the number you wanna use for your final rendering. So I'm gonna shift into GPU mode right now because I have a, a fast GPU on this computer. Okay, let's go ahead and set up our render settings. Here we want to render out a 16-bit PNG. And then we also wanna do a 1920 by 1920 rendering. If you're on a slower computer, maybe bring this down to something a little smaller. Uh, render layers, this is actually a really important thing to point out. Let's go to our lens, click on this part right out here, the glass bulb lens, right click on it, go to render layers and add to new layer. If we go to properties, our render layer shows up here. Let's go ahead and rename this and call this glass. This is gonna help us have more flexibility in Photoshop. So we wanna turn on render layers. I'm gonna render a clown pass and we wanna generate a multi-layer file. And at this point we'll go to options and I'm gonna render this out maybe about 3000, maybe I'll do 4000. And at this point I'll hit render and I'll see you in Photoshop. All right, here we are in Photoshop where I like to do just a little bit of post-production before I call it quits. Also, I thought it'd be fun to compare the CPU rendered version of this with the GPU rendered version of this. So you're looking at the CPU rendered version now, and if I toggle on over, this is the GPU rendered version. You'll notice the highlights on the black material got a lot brighter. So CPU, GPU. Now, as far as the depth of field, I enabled that on the CPU version. I forgot to on the GPU version. So that's not a bug, that's my mistake, my fault. Also, when we look here on the CPU version, I see a pretty good reflection of one of the area lights, and that seems to be either missing or very faint in the GPU version. So some subtle differences, nothing too drastic though. As far as noise, I think the CPU version's a little cleaner. I rendered this up to 400 samples on the uh, CPU, and I have a AMD 3970X, which is a 32 core, 64 thread CPU. Took about 11 minutes on the GPU. Um, it's a little noisier, I rendered to 4,000 samples on a, an RTX 3090 Ti and it took about 10 minutes. So maybe that gives you some baselines for some comparison, but overall I think both are usable renderings. Now at this point I wanna do a little light post-production on the CPU version 
and there's something I want to show you that I think you'll really like. So we added the glass to a render layer, which if we look at that, it should show just the light portion. What this allows us to do in a very handy way is make some adjustments only on this part. So I'm going to turn on the base layer that has uh, everything in it, and then I'm going to turn on the glass render layer on top and make some adjustments. So we'll take this and create a uh, adjustment layer using the curves. And I usually like to just boost them a little bit. You'll notice everything's changing. Let's hold Alt and click between these two layers. Now we're just affecting the uh, render layer that is selected there. So I like to just kind of make the whole thing a little bit brighter. I think that looks pretty nice. I also want to get a little bit of glow going on here. So I'm going to take these two. I'm going to duplicate them by just holding Alt and dragging them above everything. And I'm going to collapse them with Control E. And then from here, I'm just going to take my Gaussian blur. So I'm going to go filter and blur, Gaussian blur. And I'm going to increase the blur until this gets really blurry. And I think that's looking pretty good. I'm going to set this to linear dodge add. So you see how it gets a lot brighter. Uh, and then I'm just going to take the opacity down to zero. And then from here, we can increase the opacity of it. And you see it just gets a little hazier and we have a little bit of, of kind of a glow around there. And then the other thing I wanna do is kind of push the contrast on this black plastic material. And that's easy enough to do with our render pass called clown. So we're going to go into our magic wand tool and select the red, make sure we're on the right layer, select that red, turn off that clown pass. And then I'm gonna duplicate my base layer. So I'm just gonna hold alt and shift and drag. So now we have a copy of that. And what I wanna do with this selection made and the copy of that layer created, I'm gonna do another curves, I believe. So this is going to allow me to take that black material and make it a little more rich by dropping that down and then take that highlights, the highlights on the black and start to boost this as well. And this is gonna work better because we are in a 16-bit Photoshop document instead of like a like an 8-bit PNG or a JPEG because we have all this dynamic range to work with. The last thing I really like to do here is create a little bit of film grain. So it's an old classic approach. I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to fill it with a 50% gray just using the paint bucket. Then go to noise. So filter, noise, add noise. I did this recently, so about three is fine. And then I want to blur it. So I'll go to filter, and go to blur and then Gaussian blur and bring this down significantly. We just want to blur this so it creates this kind of a soft noise pattern. Maybe a little bit, yeah, right around there. And then what I wanna do is change it from normal to overlay. And if we zoom in, we should be able to see, if we zoom in, we should be able to see that noise. So that just kind of gives it a little bit of that film grain appearance. And if that's a bit heavy handed, maybe we go down to about 50%. This will help break up any sort of banding you might have from gradients, anything like that. So that right there is pretty much it. I'm gonna select all those layers, Control Alt Shift E to create a flattened copy. I'll put everything else in a folder and we can compare the results of before I did any post-production in Photoshop versus after post-production. So it's not a huge difference, but it's definitely enough to make, make it look a little bit more finished. That's going to be it. At this point, all we got to do is file and export as JPEG. That'll do it for today's tutorial. Until next time, happy rendering.